guys. Well, welcome, and let us pray, and then we will uh, continue our study of biblical inspiration here. Father, thank you so much for tonight. I just pray that you will be glorified through our study tonight. I pray that you'll be glorified through the ongoing ministries of the church, and we just uh, we just come to you and uh, confess our sins before you, ask you for your grace, and just ask you to, to lead us into the truth that we need to know, and we just uh, pray that we will center our lives firmly upon your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, so we're going to talk about uh, biblical inspiration. We're going to finish up that discussion tonight, and along with that, talk about uh, biblical authority, which is a related doctrine. And so where we left off, just as way of, by way of review, we left off, we talked about several views of inspiration, and we ended up uh, saying that the view of inspiration that we hold to here at High Point is verbal plenary inspiration. And verbal plenary inspiration has to do with the fact that uh, Verbal is that the words of scripture are inspired. Plenary is that all the words are inspired. And so when we're talking about biblical inspiration, we believe we have we have a very text-based approach. And what I mean text has to do with what the Bible says. And I mean this is see, for a lot of you guys have been going to church for a long time. If I'm stating the obvious, it's because some people come at this from different approaches. And it's important that we understand what we're saying. We have a very text-based approach, which means that we try to understand what the Bible says and then allow that to be the authoritative word in our lives. Um, so a question we have as we talk about verbal plenary inspiration, obviously that exact phrase is not used in the Bible, right? The word inspiration is used in the old King James, and we talked about how that means... Uh, God breathes that word, but inspiration is not a bad word for it. But this specific phrase of verbal plenary inspiration is a theological phrase to describe a certain concept. However, when we look at a, when we look at the Bible, we do see that the Bible's view of itself is that it is the word of God. Um, last week we talked about. 2 Timothy 3.16, and I'm going to go back there in my uh, Bible here. So 2 Timothy, I want to review that. And just um, this is what the scriptures say about the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.16. So if the question is, does the Bible itself teach verbal plenary inspiration or that the very words of scripture are inspired, there's a couple of verses we'll, we'll talk about here. And... Let's write a couple of these passages up here. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is the most important passage for biblical inspiration. And uh, reading from the NIV here, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the key there is that all scripture is God-breathed. So at least if we're looking for a biblical perspective, the biblical perspective is that, that all scripture is God-breathed. Now, some people who don't like this idea of, of that, some people who hold to what we talked about before as a partial inspiration, will argue for a, a, a different translation, something like every inspired scripture is also profitable. And so if you were going to say every inspired scripture is also profitable, then you would say, well, then we got to figure out which parts are inspired, and then we'll figure out whether they're profitable. Um, because this is not a class on New Testament Greek, and I don't want to get too, uh, you know, too into the language when you guys haven't studied that, I'm just going to simply say or summarize that that translation is just wrong. Virtually every English translation has some form of all scripture is uh, God-breathed and profitable. It's not every scripture that is God-breathed, it's all scripture is God-breathed. And so that's just a really silly argument. It's, it's kind of trying to find a loophole. Now, some would look, though, at 2 Timothy 3.16 and say, well, the, and this is a little bit trickier. They would say the phrase, all scripture, 
when Paul uses that phrase, the New Testament was still being written. So all scripture, they would say Paul is talking about the Old Testament. That doesn't necessarily apply to the New Testament. So I guess you could argue that, well, Paul is just saying the Old Testament is inspired. A couple of things we would say about that is Paul was specifically referencing the Old Testament when he was talking about the scriptures. But if we do agree that the New Testament does fit the category of scripture, then it would still apply to the New Testament. I mean, because the New Testament hadn't been completed, Paul didn't necessarily have this category of the New Testament. But the New Testament is scripture, so if all scripture is God-breathed, it would definitely include the New Testament. Um, turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter 3, and we'll talk about another important point. 2 Peter 3 tells us that even though Paul at that point was probably thinking primarily about the Old Testament, Paul's writings were already being recognized as scripture. 2 Peter 3, 14 to 15. And 2 Peter 3, 14 to 15. This is Peter saying, uh, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, this, by the way, would be the return of Christ. Since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Okay, we've got to keep reading. Verse, I said 15, we got to go to 16. So, so far we have Paul writing. All right. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. And the key phrase there is the other scriptures, because what Peter's doing there is he is including Paul's writings as scripture. So that gives us some um, that gives us some New Testament validation that Peter viewed Paul as writing scripture. Now we talked already about the process of canonization and uh, how it is that the books of the New Testament were recognized as scripture, but, um, and so for me, there's no doubt that the New Testament is scripture, but it is good to see validation within the New Testament itself. All right, uh, one more passage I want to look at relating to this may seem like a funny one, but I'll explain why we're going to look at it. And this is uh, Matthew 5, 17 and 18. So go to Matthew 5. All right. Now, this is where Jesus is. Uh, he's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking specifically about the law, but this has a, a reference to our doctrine of verbal plenary inspiration because he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter and not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, um, in the old King James, it used the phrase jot and tittle. It said not one jot and not one tittle will, will disappear from the law till all is accomplished. 
it fleshes that out a little bit more in the NIV when it says um, the smallest letter or the smallest stroke of a pen. Uh, if this is a little unclear, the Old Testament, as you probably know, was written in Hebrew. So on there, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. In Hebrew, you may not be able to see that on camera, this on camera very well because it's so small. But that is, uh, oh, I'm writing it backwards. That means I'm writing it the correct way because Hebrew is written backwards. But that is called a yod. That's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, that's probably what Jesus is referring to when he talks about a tittle. A tittle is probably a Hebrew yod. It almost looks like just a little dot. Uh, a jot would be that right there. It's a straight line with a little doohickey on it, and that in Hebrew is called a vav. And these are the two smallest letters in the Hebrew alphabet, the Yod and the Vav. And so when Jesus says not the smallest uh, mark or stroke of a pen will disappear from the law till all will be, will be uh, fulfilled, or like I said, as the old King James has it, the jot, the smallest jot or tittle, he's saying, like even down to the spelling, the lettering, this is the word of God. So Jesus is making quite a big deal about the actual words of Scripture and their need to be fulfilled. Now, in terms of the interpretation of that passage, briefly, Jesus is not saying that we will be under the law for all eternity. When we study the New Testament, we realize we are not still under the law. The key there is fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the law, but the point was that the law would not be abolished and even these small letters were not going to uh, go away until it was fulfilled by Jesus. So the reason I'm going through this is just, it's, it's, it's a couple of passages that talk about how the Bible talks about itself. And I mean, put very simply, the Bible does view itself as the word of God. And so, People who want to argue for some kind of a partial inspiration, like we talked about last week, that just doesn't fit what the Bible says. The Bible views itself as being entirely inspired, entirely the Word of God. All right. However, there is an objection that is very much worth discussing here. And the issue is that when we Christians say the Bible is the Word of God, let me, let me ask you this. If, if I were to ask you, we'll see if you'd answer the same way I would. If I were to ask you, why do you believe the Bible is the word of God? What, what might be an answer, assuming you do believe that? And anybody out there can also uh, post something about this on, on the comment section. What might be an answer you would give as to why you believe the Bible is the word of God? What do you say, Holly? It is because the Lord says he is, I am, so he is. It, it is, and what Holy Secretary might not have heard is, it is, the Lord says that he is the I am, and it's his word. And I, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to what she's saying. I don't think that's wrong. In fact, if we were to put a little asterisk here, oh, goodness, I think about all these, uh, I think about all of these little songs I learned as a kid, like, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. Or like, you know, I don't remember, I wish I remembered all the words, but there's a song where we used to, kind of the refrain would be periodically, how do I know the Bible tells me so. Kind of a song from my childhood. I know you guys want to hear me sing, and I don't want to disappoint. But the point is that, so a lot of times we're saying, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? Well, the Bible says it's the word of God. An objection some people raise in that case is that we're talking about circular reasoning.
Kate, you were telling me the other day that you once took a logic class, right? So what is uh, what is circular reasoning? Proving something with itself. Man, that's a perfect summary of circular reasoning. Um, oh, I, yeah. So many, so many examples I could give. I don't want to. I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail. But circular reasoning. So, so, so our, our skeptic friends will say, "Well, you believe the Bible is the word of God." But we say, "How do you know the Bible is the word of God?" Well, because the Bible says so. Well, we only know that it's the, Bible, the word of God if the Bible says so. If we assume the Bible is the word of God. In other words, you have to kind of believe it before you accept the Bible as the word of God. Now, there's the, the, the answer we would give to that is twofold. Point A is that on some level, it's a fair point. And we do want to remember, friends, that Faith is an important aspect of religion. We don't call it the Christian faith for no reason. You're only going to really accept the authority of the Bible as the word of God if you believe that the Bible is the word of God. So some of the question is, um, are, you, are you willing to believe it? Are you willing to accept it? And we believe in supernatural things. We believe that God does a work. We believe that God's Holy Spirit supernaturally enables us to see the truth. We believe that God does a work in people that saves them, puts his spirit within them, and then they are able to see these things. So on one level, there's something supernatural going on here. And uh, we would say that there's a, 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 a divine, almost like a self-authentication for the scriptures, for those who are believers. And so in that sense, I mean, we do have to understand that on some level, you can't, you can't prove the Bible's the word of God by a scientific formula, which is what some people are wanting to do. It just doesn't work that way. There is very, very good evidence. Uh, when we talk about what is called apologetics, apologetics doesn't mean apologizing. It means defending the faith. And we're going to talk about some really good evidences that validate the truth of the Bible. And the evidence is really, really, really good. But I just want to be fair here. Sometimes we have to distinguish really, really good evidence from absolute proof. If we say we can prove the Bible is the word of God, if somebody has their, if somebody has their mind made up not to believe it, they're going to find a reason not to believe it. I mean, you can get, you can go through the evidences, but sometimes somebody, God has to get them to a point where they're ready to accept his word. And so our, when we talk about faith, it's not that it's blind faith, but we also have to understand that you don't understand the truth of God's word or that God's word is the truth just because you're smarter than people who don't. There's a lot of smart people out there who don't believe the Bible is the word of God. It's, in some sense, a work God does in you. However, there's another question. That's not the whole story. There's a faith aspect of this, but there's another aspect of it as well, which is that if we were right, if the Bible really is the word of God, and I use this phrase already, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it back up here again. Let me, let me make some room for myself. We'll leave 2 Timothy out there. Such an important verse. The Bible is self self authenticating. All right. I'm going to give you guys a, a, little, uh, a little example here to help you understand what I mean by self-authenticating. I think you'll follow the example, and if you don't, oh well, it's a fun example, so I'm going to do it anyway. Have any of you guys seen the, the movie, um, it's a kung fu movie called Ip Man. Anybody seen that one? Okay. If you haven't, maybe that's your homework assignment to watch Ip Man. No, that's okay. 
But there's this there's this part of the movie where there's this guy who he comes into this town in China, and he's gonna open a kung fu school. So he starts challenging all the local kung fu masters to a fight, and he's beating them all. And then finally he uh, finally he challenges Ip Man. He hears this guy Ip Man is really good, so he challenges him. He goes to his house, he challenges him, and he gets beaten by Ip Man. So then he has to leave town because he didn't beat everybody. The reason uh, I bring this up is because there is a hint of truth in ancient Chinese culture in this. This is something that would happen where if somebody wanted to start a kung fu school in those days, and you have to understand they didn't have the same kind of laws here. They didn't have the same kind of police forces. You would, uh, you would say in a given town, hey, I'm going to start a kung fu school. If anyone wants to challenge me, I'll show you that I have the right to start a kung fu school. I'll beat you in a fight. And guys would have to win like, you know, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 fights before anyone wanted to learn Kung Fu from them. Why is that? Huh. Some of you guys know that I'm into martial arts. In, uh, in American martial arts, we have this uh, expression called McDojo. And a McDojo is a dojo where you don't really learn martial arts. You think you're learning to fight, but you're not really. You're getting your belts, and you, you think you're really hot stuff. But then, I don't know, somebody mugs you in the street, and you can't do anything because it didn't really work. It's because we've kind of commercialized martial arts. Well, in, the, in ancient China, they didn't have, and they wouldn't call, I, they don't call it a dojo in China. That's a Japanese word. I'm trying to remember what they call it in, in Chinese, but that's okay. Not important. But they didn't have these because a kung fu instructor had to win a bunch of fights. He had to authenticate himself before he started teaching kung fu. And so these instructors, it's like if, if an instructor said, hey, I'm the baddest dude in town, so you should, you know, learn to fight from me. Doesn't mean anything unless he proves it. The Bible does have what we could call internal proofs, internal validations that it is true when we look for them. Now, a skeptic who doesn't want to believe the Bible is the word of God isn't going to, but for people who are willing to listen and think through it, there are some really, really good reasons to believe that the Bible is the word of God. All right. And I'm going to talk about a, a few of those Kind of give you, kind of give you some some things to think about as we think about. We would expect the Bible to be able to authenticate itself and hold its own. Um, I'm gonna. I don't want to write this down. It's too much trouble. But listen up. I'm going to say this. Uh, let's say this slowly. This is a phrase that a guy by the name of Lewis Ferry Chafer used to say. He's not alive now, but he was actually, he founded the school where I went to seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary. So he's a, he was a theologian of the early 20th century. But when Dr. Schaefer was talking about the Bible, he used to say, the Bible is not the sort of book that man would write if he could or could write if he would. Now I'm going to put that in a little plainer language. That's kind of like a little bit of a woodchuck chucking kind of a thing. But when he said it's not the kind of book a man could write if he would, he's saying that if a human being without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, without God working through him, wanted to write the Bible, he couldn't do it. It's not something that human beings could produce. And when he says could write if he would, what he's getting at there is, even if humans could have written the Bible, they probably wouldn't have wanted to. That may sound funny to you, but I'll give you some reasons that Dr. Chafer talked about. Um, some of you know that some concepts in the Bible are hard to understand, right? There are some concepts, like for example, the Bible's concept of God is not easy to understand. We have this doctrine, the Trinity, where we have one God who eternally exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we have one God, but he's in three persons. And that confuses a lot of people. I believe it's truth, but I still get confused about it sometimes, right? It's a little confusing. It's a lot confusing. Why? If, if, if a human being were going to write the Bible and make it up, why wouldn't he come up with a concept a little easier to understand?
I mean, I would, I, 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 see, I see what you're saying about that. He was talking about, about, you know, about Freud's kind of, you know, three personalities within our mind that are in dialogue. But when we're talking about the Trinity, we are talking about three distinct persons, not just three voices within a mind. So it's kind of a kind of an important point. But um, I believe the Bible teaches the Trinity very clearly. But something like that, it's like. I think if a human being were going to sit down to write this, they would probably make something a little easier to understand. One of the biggest ones is the Bible's view of humanity, the Bible's view of human beings. Now, what does the Bible say? What's one of the things the Bible says is true of every single human being besides Jesus? What do you got? We're all sinners, exactly. Um, when you read the Old Testament, most of the Old Testament revolves around the history of the nation Israel, right? And the history of the nation Israel was mostly written by people who were living in Israel. Now, what do we see again and again when we read the Old Testament? We see people disobedient and God judging them. We see sin. We see people worshiping idols. We see people wanting to go back into Egypt. The Bible views human beings as utter, utterly sinful. It, view, it views them with no capacity for good apart from the grace of God. Um, this is from uh, Psalm 14, 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand and seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. And that's also quoted in Romans 3. Paul says that we human beings are, by nature, children of wrath. Um... We call this the doctrine of total depravity, the fact that we are all, apart from God's work in us, we are all completely sinful. And this is a pretty bleak view of humanity. And when we look at the history, the tragic history of Israel in the Old Testament, how again and again they fell into sin and God's judgment came, you would, you would really wonder why on earth, if this was just made up by human beings, by Israelites, why wouldn't they put themselves in a, in a better light? Usually, go ahead, Claude. But then in most of the prophets of the written writing of the Bible, were they all Jews? Most of them were, 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 were all 66, would you say? I mean, not, not all 66, <laughs> but the prophets and apostles were yeah. all Jews that wrote the Right. With the exception of like maybe one or two people, the the Bible was exclusively written by Jews. Now, even the New Testament, Jews who were Jewish Christians, but yeah, almost exclusively written by by Jewish people. Uh, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, was probably not a Jew, but he was a Christian, of course. But um, almost all of it. And you just wonder, like we've been talking a lot about this in, in like the news and stuff, how. Sometimes, sometimes people, when they write their own history, they'll give a slanted view of history. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, 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 in, like when people write the American history books, they want to make America maybe look a little better than it was. And you have this phrase, you've probably heard this before, the winners write the history books, right? So whoever wins the wars always makes themselves look like bright and shiny. The history in the Bible is like a complete exception to that because they don't set out to make themselves look good because God is the hero of the Bible story and you have human beings presented as utterly sinful and in desperate need of God's salvation and so you would just wonder if the Bible was written by human beings why would they put themselves in such a bleak light a little quote from uh Dr. Schaefer, who I mentioned before, and this is a, uh, he's wordy, but we'll, we'll pull it apart a little bit. But Schaefer wrote, 
Yet, if it be contended that the Bible is not of divine origin, there is no alternative other than that man, the supposed author of the scriptures, has sat in judgment on himself and is able to compre comprehend what he demonstrates himself to be unable to comprehend, namely, the sinfulness of sin. And what Kafer is getting at is human beings always, we want to make ourselves look good. People don't like to talk about how bad they are. So when the Bible talks about how bad people are, to put it mildly, that's probably, that's probably coming from God. That's probably not man's assessment of himself. They were, well, were, the question was, were the prophets writing about themselves or were they writing about Israel as a whole? This is when my seminary professors would always do this annoying thing when they were given an either-or question and they would say yes. But yeah, and, and, and what that means, it's not an either-or, it's a both and. The prophets would include themselves in this. Now, a lot of times they're trying to call the people to repentance and so they might be, you know, they might be in a better place than some of the people that are calling to repentance, but they always admitted that they were wrong, that they were sinners. Think about Isaiah. Not all that long ago, we went through a series on Isaiah at High Point, and some of you guys remember some of those sermons. Jake and Holly, I don't remember if you guys were going to High Point yet when we preached on, uh, is it Isaiah, either six or seven, but when Isaiah is commissioned by God to go to the people of Israel. And he goes into the temple, and he sees these angels swirling around, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah's like, have mercy on me, Lord. I am a man of unclean lips. That means he, he, he sends a speech. I, you know, I dwell among a, a people of unclean lips. And he's basically acknowledging he is a sinner. And there's kind of like this danger zone thing going on there, because it's like he's in the presence of God, He's a sinner. If God doesn't, uh, if God doesn't save him and cleanse him, he's got to be in a lot of trouble. And so, uh, yeah, the prophets definitely acknowledge that they they themselves are sinners, and they're calling the sinful people to repentance. But why? What's that? Yeah, if it's calling for people to change, wouldn't it have to present the accurate picture? Yeah, yeah, it would, but yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, I think it would, but the point is that I think that human beings generally, generally human beings are really good at recognizing that other people need to change. You ever notice that, how easy it is for, for, for people to recognize that other people need to change, but they don't usually recognize their own need to change? That's why I'm saying, you know, it's God lumps us all together, that we're all sinners. We all, you know, we all need change. We all need repentance. We all need salvation. Kind of dovetails into the next argument Kafer made, too, which is the Bible's view of salvation. I don't know how many of you guys have had the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, the plan of salvation. I don't have the opportunity near as often as, as I want to. And of course, COVID kind of diminishes a little bit, but I want to share the gospel more than I do. It's something the Lord needs to work on in the end. But when I do, I share, you know, how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He took the punishment we deserve because we are sinners. It's kind of summarizing this fast here, I guess. But, you know, he rose again on the third day, and now he offers a eternal life to anyone who will trust in him and him alone for salvation a lot of times i get i get people i get responses when i share that like so what do i have to do what do i have to do for my salvation and you're like well you don't you don't have to do anything you have to believe something jesus did it all right that's what we see jesus paid it all that really bothers people no i want to do something i want to pardon this i want to earn my salvation so the Bible's view of salvation is that 
Human beings can do nothing to earn their salvation. We cannot be saved by our works. And that's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion, including some religions that, that claim to be Christianity, but they're teaching something else. You ask anybody else. I remember, and, and I'm not, my point here isn't to bash on Buddhists. I believe it's a false religion, but I like Buddhists. I like talking to them. They're fun. But I was talking to a girl. We were in the same work training, and it was on a break. And, uh, you know, we were just talking about our different religion. Of, I was trying to, you know, get her to trust Jesus for salvation. You could say I was trying to convert her. I don't know that she was exactly trying to convert me because that's not exactly the way Buddhists think about things. But we were talking about some differences, and I was explaining there's nothing we can do to, our, to earn our salvation because we can't do it. God has to do it for us. Jesus has to do it for us. And she's like, yeah, well, see, that's a major difference because in, in Buddhism, we have to do it. And uh, But that's something you'll find in every uh, in every other religion. The Bible's view of salvation, that you can do nothing to earn your salvation and God alone can save you. It's hard to believe man would come up with a, a story like that. Go ahead. The Cothers, you say? Yeah, Cothers. And I guess it was like they they were Catholic slash Christian, and, and they got persecuted by the Catholics, but they also believed um, that you could pray your way into purity, hmm. pray your way to be, to have virginity in your life and purity in your life, and you just had to pray to the Virgin Mother. And so... Uh, You know, I don't, I don't know about that particular sect. I do want to say, in reference to that, though, because it sounds like it was a breakaway Catholic group, and they, they had some ideas about how you would pray into something. The Cothers, I'm not familiar with. But it is worth saying that throughout it, be, before the Protestant Reformation, before Martin Luther broke away and started teaching this, you know, this doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, there were a lot of other groups that taught that through the years and were persecuted for it. Um, one group in particular was called the um, the Waldensians, and they followed this guy named uh, Peter Peter Waldo. It's hard to find him, but but you know. But and there's a lot of a lot of groups like that throughout history have recognized this this gospel. But one of the reasons that people have been so hesitant to accept the gospel of salvation by grace through faith that we trust in Jesus for salvation is because almost everything else in life is you work for your reward. You want to get it. You have to work for it. And that's not a, that's not a bad thing. We teach our kids that, right? I mean, you, uh, you know, you're not going to, you know, it's not, life isn't going to be handed to you, you know? And that's true, but God works in a very different way because we can't work our way to him. He meets us where we're at and he does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And, you know, Dr. Tafer argued, and I agree with him, that I don't think human beings would come up with a story like that. We'd find a way to make ourselves the hero. You know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to accomplish it. Kind of like, uh, and I love the story, but, you know, kind of like the the Lord of the Rings. I mean, it's like, if you guys have seen the movie or if you've read the book, you know, Frodo has to take the ring to Mount Doom, and he goes through all these things. But ultimately, Frodo makes his way to Mount Doom and throws that ring. You know, it's not like... It's not like there's a god who just picks him up and carries him in and you know throws the ring in the fire for him or something. It's like that's the way we think about things. You gotta you, you gotta you gotta trudge your way to it. And biblical salvation does not work like that. All right, a couple of other couple of other points we'll we'll go through here. Prophecy and fulfillment. The Bible records thousands of prophecies that actually were fulfilled in history. So one of the ways we can validate the truth of scripture is that prophecies were in fact fulfilled as they were prophesied. A lot of them were prophecies about Jesus. For instance, King David wrote one of the Psalms he wrote that was prophetic about Jesus and his death on the cross was Psalm 22. If you study Psalm 22, you see that it gives 
if you study it from maybe maybe a medical standpoint, but also a torture standpoint, Psalm 22 gives a pretty vivid description of a crucifixion. The reason, or one reason that is so significant is because crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. Um, pretty powerful stuff. Um, we have a lot of prophecies about events in Israel's history that came to fulfillment. We actually have a lot of prophecies about, about what we call secular history that came into fulfillment. Things like the rise of the Persian Empire or, or the Greek Empire. Things that, you know, especially in the book of Daniel that were prophesied. Um, in fact, skeptics, people who don't believe the Bible is the word of God, they claim that the book of Daniel had to be written like three or four hundred years after the time period in which it was written. Anyone want to guess why they think that? They don't believe in prophecy and fulfillment. They don't believe things could be prophesied and fulfilled like that, so they think, well, it had to have been written after the fact because the fulfillment is too obvious. It's too obvious that this is the fulfillment of this. The writer had to be looking back and writing about what had already happened and lying and saying it was prophecy. Now, there's no evidence for that at all. All the evidence points to these books were written in the time period they claimed to be written in. But so prophetic fulfillment, the fact that the Bible could, could uh, predict these things so accurately is a very powerful argument for the fact that it really is God's word. All right. Go ahead, Holly. I'm also too, like you were saying, um, so say they were going to, a politician, political people were going to write a book, they would do all the good stuff about themselves. Mm -hmm. So the Bible, it, like, Paul was Saul before mm -hmm. he became Paul, and, like, all the stories of the kings and all their drama and all that. Yeah. So. Let, let's let's think about a couple of these a couple of these uh, biblical figures. Holly's talking again about the history of the Bible. Um, all right. When we think about ancient Israel and we think about ancient Israelite history, they call the reign of King David and King Solomon. Obviously, King Solomon was King David, King David's son. They call that the Golden Age of Israel, right? This is the time when things were really going well for the Israelite monarchy, the, the, the glory days. That's why in the, in the later writings, they're always talking about, you know, God restoring the kingdom of David. But... So David is kind of like one of the main heroes in Israel's history. But when we look at the life of David, it's pretty imperfect, isn't it? I mean, if you know the Bathsheba story, it's not a good story for David. There, there, there's a few other things David did that are, that are rather unsavory. That you would think that if Israelite historians who weren't writing under divine inspiration were wanting to write about one of the great heroes of Israel's history, they probably would have left those bad parts out. That's what secular history does, even today, to some extent. Not, not as much, but throughout history, you know? It's like, I don't know, in the last, you know, I've learned, I've learned so many things. I'm not saying, I'm not condemning the guy all around. I mean, history, human beings are sinners, right? And everybody's got some sin, but you know, as an adult, I've learned a lot of things about George Washington that I didn't learn in grade school, right? Because <laughs> I, I grew up reading the Bible. I had a lot more dirt on King David as a kid than I did on George Washington. That's because the Israelites were honest historians because they were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And my, I don't know, Christian school history textbook was a little less honest about George Washington. All right. Again, I'm not I'm not trying to knock, you know, George Washington. Now, James K. Polk, he was a shining figure. I'm just kidding. James K. Polk was a president, and nobody cares. So I'm just being funny. Um, I'm sorry. That was a that was a that was a silly nerd joke. Um, I'll tell you guys a funny story just because that came up. I probably shouldn't, but I will. 
but I have a friend named Paul, and Paul is a historian, and he used to teach where I teach at San Diego Christian College. We used to share an office. And he was telling me one time that in his history class, he was telling, when he was first introducing himself to the students, he said, tell me who your favorite historical figure is as part of, you know, what's your name? Where are you from? Who's your favorite historical figure? I think, oh, that's interesting. He said, he said, yeah, about two thirds of them said George Washington was their favorite historical figure. And he said, um, and I was like, I was like, well, at least they, because Paul and I were always commiserating about how little the college students know. And I was like, well, at least they know who George Washington is. And then he's like, well, the thing is, I gave that as an example. I said, like, for example, if George Washington's your favorite historical figure, say George Washington. So I told him, <laughs> I told him next time he, could, he, should, he should use James K. Polk. I'm like, well, if, so if James K. Polk is your favorite historical figure, say James K. Polk. And I, I don't know, he went off to the United Arab Emirates to teach. So I don't, I don't think that works quite the same way there, but I still thought it was a good suggestion. Okay, enough James K. Um, last, last piece of evidence, and then we'll kind of tie up for the night and open it up for some questions. And again, if anyone happens to be watching and would like to ask a question, please, uh, please give it. My brother, I see asked, where is your mask? We're social distancing. I'm a long way away from everybody out there. And my brother's like, my brother's just being a clown. He does that. Um, the Bible as literature is the final kind of uh, kind of evidence we'll talk about tonight. We'll talk about a few more things, of course, next week. But um, I think I mentioned this on a Sunday morning once. But there was a there was a, a guy who. A guy uh, around the time our country was being founded, whose name was Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine wrote a famous book called The Age of Reason. Thomas Paine is what we call a skeptic. He did not believe the Bible was the word of God. And he claimed that the Bible was just a bunch of myths put together by uneducated peasants. And so he had a very, a very low view of the Bible as literature. Now, why was that? It was because Thomas Paine didn't really understand the Bible in its literary context. What we mean is he didn't understand what kind of literature it was. So he was comparing the Bible to, say, Charles Dickens or, um, I don't know, maybe even maybe even some historians who, who, who would write other kinds of books, but, but writers of his day, and he's like thinking, well, the people of my day are a lot better writers than the Bible, because he was comparing the Bible, he was measuring the Bible by, uh, like, 18th century standards. But when, when we study the Bible in terms of where it came from, where in history, we study the kind of literature it actually is, we find that the Bible is absolutely brilliant literature. There are brilliant ways the Bible is woven together. It's woven together into a unified story, even though we have authors who are writing over a period of, uh, you know, over a thousand years. And even within the books themselves, like I'm, I'm going to start a new series in the Gospel of Mark on Sunday. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. It is a brilliant literary document. Even, even people who don't believe the Bible is the word of God, studying what, what we know about the literature of that time nowadays, people look at the Gospel of Mark and they think, man, wow, that is brilliant. The literary connections, the, the structures, the way it's put together, the Bible is just brilliantly put together literature. Um, Lewisbury Chafer talked about this, and he was really ahead of his time because a lot of the literary studies that that have been done now hadn't even been done in Dr. Schaefer's day. But um, so a couple of things we would say, even those who deny the supernatural origin of the Bible agree that it is a literary wonder. The problem for them is how did it come about? Many of the Bible's authors had little or no formal education. If the literary greatness of the Bible is due to the natural abilities of the human authors, then why did they not leave behind other great works? Um, the Bible was also written almost entirely by Jews. So one of the questions we have is if the Jews of that period were such a great literary people, 
why don't we have other great works of literature like the Bible if it's not the case that the Bible is a, uh, a book of supernatural origin? Again, Lewis Berry Chafer made these points in around 1947, and since then there have just been incredible literary discoveries that show us that the Bible is just brilliant literature, and the men who wrote it, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, they just wouldn't have been able to put it together. All right, man, so many things to say, and time it goes so fast. But, uh, questions or comments? Mm. Yeah. Thomas, Thomas Paine was a very famous writer and obviously a very smart man. And, I mean, I want to be fair to Thomas Paine. Now, he wasn't a believer. He needed the Lord, and insofar as I know, he never found him. That's quite unfortunate. He wasn't stupid, but we can't expect him to know everything we know today about archaeological discoveries and ancient Near Eastern studies, because most of that hadn't been discovered yet. So he was making a lot of assumptions, and he was following the thinking of his day. And uh, since then, you know, in a few hundred years since Thomas Paine was writing that, we've made, and when I say we, I mean like archaeologists. I wasn't there for, you know, pretty much any of it. I read about it in books. Um, you know, uh, the human race, in particular the archaeological and scholarly communities, have made incredible discoveries, historical and archaeological and literary, that just do incredible things to validate the truthfulness of the Bible. Now, the details here are more than we're going to talk about in this Bible study. As riveting as it is, some of you would, you know, I don't know, we could, be t we could, we could talk about it for the next six years or something. So if you want to, you know, if you ever want more information, if you want a, a book or something to read about this, ask me i can always uh i can always recommend them i was talking to uh our youth leader nick Berto, about something in the bible and i was recommending he was asking me a lot of questions and i was like hey maybe you should read this book that i was telling him you know you need about four shots of espresso for this thing because it's like you know it's one of these books that it's like the page is like that much writing and then that much footnote <laughs> all right what else Amen. Sing it over. Well, let's uh, pray, and then, well, I guess we're going to pray corporately, but I'll say a closing prayer for the video. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for your word, and just uh, that you'll bless us this week and uh, preserve us till we come together to talk about even more exciting stuff next week. In Jesus' name, amen. For all of you out there on Facebook land, we are having live services on Sundays at 1030. Bring your mask and come see us.